I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. When we were children, we learned how to act. We learned how to smile to get what we want. We learned how to cry extra hard to get what we want. We trained from early on to be constant actors. We were continually acting. And... You want to be aware of the fact that you are an actor and that other people are doing this as well. You know, I I wanted to ask because it's very relevant to, I feel, more than ever to today's current environment, the law of conformity, where essentially it's related to herd behavior, where the more you attach yourself to the herd, whatever herd that is, the more irrational your decision making might be. And... I'm just curious, how do you go about avoiding conforming to group behavior? Well, the first thing is to be honest with yourself and to realize that you are conforming to other people. The worst thing is to be in denial. That's what I'm trying to hit you over the head with in this book. You'll you'll naturally go, oh, I'm not like that. Well, hell, you're not. You're much more of a conformist than you realize because that is human nature. We are a social animal, and I go into the neuroscience and the biology. You are not immune to this, no matter what you tell yourself. And I make the point that everyone has a character. We have qualities that are deeply ingrained in us, based on our genetics, based on our childhood and and our parents, and our lives tend to fall into patterns, weird patterns that we repeat over and over and over again. We have compulsive behavior. And so you want to be able to judge people's character by seeing their patterns, not by looking at their resume or their charming smile or everything that they try and show you, but look at their past and their patterns and they will reveal that underlying character. All right, so I'm going to begin. So happy to have Robert Greene on the podcast. First off, he's you might know him. He's the best-selling author of The 48 Laws of Power and Mastery, but his brand new book is The Laws of Human Nature. It's an intense book. Uh, Robert, welcome to the show again. Thanks for having me, James. My pleasure. I'm so happy to have you on the book because, first off, I think most people don't know a lot of these sort of primal motivations or desires or pieces of our human nature that 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 motivate essentially our every decision. I think I think we we go around thinking, oh, I have 
free will. Nobody's nobody's able to influence me or manipulate me or I'm over all of my past traumas. I'm free. But there's these primal, almost evolutionary parts of ourselves that that are human nature. And you you point out all these different laws where uh, we're, we're somewhere on the spectrum of each one of these laws and recognizing them and how to use them for us and also how to avoid using people, other people using them against us is critical. And that seems to be the, the main point of the book. Yeah. I want it to be kind of like a really cold splash of water on your face to sort of wake you up because a lot of these things are sort of counterintuitive. We generally walk around thinking that we know the people that we're dealing with. Uh, we think we know who we are, what we want in life, what motivates us. And I'm trying to point out to you that you're, it, things are actually much more complicated. You're much more of a mystery to yourself. People are much more of an enigma than you think. And I wanted to design this book to really help you. I call it a kind of code book for helping to decipher people's behavior to figure out what's going on behind the mask. If you've read any of my books, you know that I'm constantly referring to the masks that people wear in the 48 Laws of Power. A person of power is never really an open book. They're very hard to read. You don't know what they're thinking. But all of us in, in everyday life, we wear a mask. We pretend to be interested in people when we're actually quite bored or we're toadying up to the boss or we're doing saying something to impress people. We're continually wearing masks. And if we're wearing masks, so are other people. And so if you don't understand the people you're dealing with, you don't have a clue as to what's really going on behind their friendly smiles, then you're going to say something or do something based on a lack of information and bad things will ensue. So I want to help you untangle all of these knots of misinterpretations in your life. Right. And, and it's like you just said, like, let's take a, a classic example. Someone might say something nice to their boss as a pandering strategy. Like, oh, if I say something nice, maybe the boss will be nice back. But understanding specifically what these strategies are, why we are doing them, what their effectiveness is, is how to make them more effective, understanding when people are using these strategies against us, whether they know it or not, uh, these are important to making our own lives basically more uh, effective and successful. Yeah, I mean, when you give, you give the example of the boss, if you're trying to uh, impress him or her with something that you say, oftentimes you, do the, you say the wrong thing. You actually stir up their insecurities. People are not often aware that a boss or someone more powerful than you is often even more insecure than you are. They're riddled with anxieties. Do people like me? How am I being perceived? And sometimes you're flattering something that they don't want to have flattered. Like you're imagining, wow, you're such a clever person and you, and you flatter them for that, implying that they're kind of Machiavellian and strategic, whereas they think of themselves as being a really good, noble person. And you've kind of crossed you're communicating in the wrong way. So being aware of what I call people's self-opinion, it's one of the laws, being aware that people have an opinion of themselves, an image of themselves as being good or noble or, or whatever, you, if you challenge that inadvertently in your attempt to flatter, you're gonna cause the, the, the absolute wrong reaction. So these are some of the things that I mentioned before where it's not always uh, intuitive, it's not always something that seems obvious to us. You know, it's interesting because you, you bring up, um, I, I, as I was reading this, I, every chapter, first off, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, this applies to 10 situations in my life. And I, I was reading very closely and taking notes, like, how can I, how can I do this situation better so that I could have some understanding of what my actions should be? But then I kept thinking, then, and I kept thinking with each chapter, this is it. This is the chapter that's the most important chapter in the book. But <laughs> as I as I read the next chapter, I'm like, oh no, this is the most important chapter of the book. Um, and and you mentioned that chapter about um, you know what what you call the law of willfulness, where the subtitle yeah. or the chapter title is lower people's self defenses by confirming their self opinion. I want to actually start yeah. with some questions about that chapter. But first, sure, it seems like what's really important is 
along with the laws, there's this idea that you have to step outside and almost observe yourself and observe other people in this meta way to to right. to to see what laws are are happening are taking place. And on the one hand, awareness is the key. So understanding what the laws are is is important for observing them. But but how can one cultivate or practice this way? You know, let, let's say you're angry at someone. It's hard to kind of step out of yourself and say, oh, well, I'm angry because, you know, my mother didn't give me enough love and um, I'm, I'm eager for validation and whatever. Well, that's the question. And I'm hoping that the book will kind of train you in this sort of meta way of looking at yourself just by virtue of how much material I throw at you. But the idea is, just take, for example, your own emotions. Um, I, I make the point that we don't really understand the source of our own emotions. And you'll, you'll, you'll argue with me, the listener, you say, well, yes, I do. I know why I'm angry. I know why I'm excited. But you actually don't. And neuroscience will back this up. The part of the brain that processes emotions is not directly linked to the frontal cortex where we have our rational thought thinking processes. So when you feel anger, you sense the emotion, but you, it's not immediately translated into words and you have to interpret this feeling that you have. And often you interpret it based on what's right in front of you, like something triggered it, like a, what somebody said or something you saw. But in fact, the source is deeper within it could be something from your childhood. It could be something someone said a week ago. It could be some deep uh, layer of insecurity that you're not aware of. So the point here in this particular instance, the, the training process that we're talking about, is don't accept your emotions at face value. Law number one, it's just simply don't sim say, oh, I'm, I'm angry and just go with it and, and rationalize it to yourself. Dig deeper. Try to figure out why you are angry. What is the source of it? Maybe they're able to take a step back and not accept your own emotions at face value and challenge them, and challenge why you're feeling this way. That's enough to train you to start to have distance from yourself and not just simply accept everything at face value. It, and the whole it, book it, is basically... Um, it, it's sorry, so hard on. though, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's so hard though, because let's say you're feeling that anger because someone just said something and you could say, I'm going to think about, or I, th I shouldn't say, I shouldn't use the general you, I'll say me. I, I tend to okay. think to myself, I'm angry and I'm going to think about why in a second. But first, I really need to say X, Y, and Z. Well, that's fine. I mean, I'm not trying to do anything that's impossible. Um, I make the point in the book that we are human, that we're flawed, that we're descended from primates, that we have certain limitations. And I want you to work with your limitations. You're not going to be an angel. Nothing's going to come easy. And in the moment when you feel that anger, go with it. It's okay. But what I want you to do is the next day or then in a few hours afterwards to reassess yourself, to go back and look at it and try and figure out, you know, why did I react this way? Perhaps you can write it down. Perhaps you can begin to analyze it. I'm not trying to say you have to become a robot suddenly overnight where you don't give in to any of your emotions. That's impossible. We all feel things immediately. We get angry. Certain things in the news, for instance, trigger that, that gut reaction. And uh, it, it starts chemical processes that are very powerful. But if you can start to begin to question yourself, to begin to look at it from a slight bit of distance, it's like developing a muscle over time. And you'll be, it'll become something that's more natural to you. And uh, it'll 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 you'll reap incredible benefits from this ability to observe yourself. So so I'm gonna start off asking you some questions about some of the specific laws of human nature. But I also yeah. want to mention with each chapter, it's it's really well structured. Like you give examples and stories from all over history and literature. Mm -hmm. There are there it's based. This, the other way to view this book is this is like a collection of 500 biographies that you've written. <laughs> so it's so much information in here. And, and then you use those, those biographies to, to, you know, demonstrate these laws. It's just, it's just fascinating. So, so, okay. The law of willfulness, um, maybe describe that. And I have some questions about that, but the, the real title of this chapter is, you know, lower people's defenses by confirming their self opinion. 
Well, the idea is that the um, normally when you, you can't go through life without the ability to influence people, to persuade them, to have some effect on them. The sense that you have no effect on people will make you miserable. So we all want to have, have that ability to influence people. And normally when we, we're in a situation like that, we're kind of locked in ourselves. We're not thinking so much of the other person. We want to charm them. We want to impress them with something we say that's clever. And really the key is to think of them first and not of yourself. And the, the, the way to think about other people is to realize that they have an opinion about themselves. Now, you have an opinion about yourself as well. And um, I mean, you, the listener. And I, claim, I say that there are three universal components to your opinion about yourself that, that are pretty much basic to everyone. Number one, you feel that you are an autonomous individual, that you have freedom, that you act on your own free will. Number two, that you're intelligent and rational. You may not be Einstein, but you think in your field, you're pretty damn smart. And then the third is that you're basically a good person. You think about other people, you're decent, you have good values. Now, this self-opinion could be unrealistic. You might actually not be so decent. You might actually not be that smart. You might not be, uh, in fact, you're probably not as independent as you think. And if that self-opinion of yours becomes too out of touch with reality, then some problems, some psychological problems can ensue. So most of us have an opinion that's somewhat grounded in reality. If, you, if you're in an argument or a discussion with someone and you inadvertently make them feel that they are unintelligent, that they are not acting out of free will, that they've been manipulated, or that they're not really a good person, you didn't do that on purpose. You don't, you're not even aware that you did that. But just the fact that you might have triggered that thought in them Wow, he thinks that he maybe is implying that I'm not such a uh, you know thoughtful person. Well, at the moment that crosses their mind, they become defensive and they become defensive, they close off to you. And you'll never know why. You'll think, wow, what an a-hole. Why are they being so tough? And why aren't they listening to me, et cetera? But it's your fault. You said something that triggered this. So you have to be aware that people think of themselves in a certain way. And you have to work within that and and not only uh, not challenge those self-opinions, but even validate it in some way. If you validate their self-opinion, suddenly they open up. And I talk in this in, in this book, of, in that chapter of an instance where it's, we've all experienced that. When, we, when we're in love with someone, when we're in love, our defenses come down because we feel that the other person appreciates us and likes us for our qualities. And so we lose our defensiveness and we become open to their influence. It's not like you have to make people fall in love, but you can lower their defenses by validating their sense of who they are. It's, it's a critical, critical law. So, so in that case, um, uh, as an example, I mean, there's, there's many examples we could look at, but in, let's say you're seeing someone, you lower your defenses because you think that uh, perhaps vulnerability will, uh, and honesty, uh, just putting it bluntly, will, you know, entice them down the romantic path with you. What should one be doing instead? Well, um, just simply being honest and sincere is, um, not often the best path. I've made that clear in all of my books, in power, in seduction, in, in all of them. Um, because, and we know that, if you're always telling people exactly what you think of them, you're going to cause a lot of trouble in life. We're always tailoring what we say to other people. We're always aware that we don't want to offend them. So um, when you're trying to appeal to that other person, let's say it's in a, a romantic situation, you want to get outside of yourself. You want to stop thinking about yourself. We're all so wrapped up, we're so self-absorbed that we're thinking, do they like me? Am I impressing them? Do they think I'm charming or whatever? Stop that and start thinking about them and their, their frame of mind, their needs, their values. You want to get outside of yourself. And, I, and the book is a manual for training your people how to get outside of yourself, how to develop the natural empathy we all have. We humans have an incredible ability to get inside the mental states of other people 
but it's a virtually untapped power that we have. So how do you basically figure out what someone's self-opinion of themselves is so that you could then validate it? And, and you describe that as elevating your perspective. So you're kind of outside the situation a little bit so you could observe, but what's, what's the precise technique well, if there it's, is one? It's, it's pretty, I told you that there are these universals. So you can assume that people think they're intelligent, uh, decent, moral, and that they're autonomous. But then there's specific ones. There'll be people who think I am really self-reliant. I don't need other people. I get things done by myself. That's their opinion. Um, other people think, wow, I'm really clever and strategic. I'm even a little bit Machiavellian. Nobody can top me. I'm always one up on other people. Um, and these clues come out or seep out in people in their everyday conversation. The book is kind of inter an interconnected whole. So in chapter three, I'm training you how to observe people's nonverbal behavior, how to read between the lines between what people say and also what they communicate in their body language. So in throughout the book, I'm giving you cues as to what people, what people are really, really like. Um, often, if they are very strongly one quality, like hyper-masculine, hyper-tough, that's covering up a, an insecurity from deep within, like they're very actually quite insecure about that quality. So you want to be aware of this. But everybody has a specific Besides those universal three qualities I mentioned, people will have specific things. And it's not like I can give you the golden key how to interpret what that is, because each person's an individual and it will depend on them. If I spent a couple hours with you, James, I would probably begin to figure it out. I can think of what mine is. Mine is that I do think of myself as an extremely independent person. Um, nobody controls me. Nobody manipulates me. Well, in fact, you know, I'm not being completely honest with myself, but I give cues, I give clues as to what that could be by the books that I write, obviously, and by the lectures that I give and what I say. I believe that I'm always no more than the other person. People are constantly giving cues as to what that opinion could be. You're just not paying attention. Right. And so chapter three, see through people's masks. You know, the hard, the, the interesting thing about this, and, and you, you basically allude to this throughout the book, is that people in general are x-ray machines. So as an example, and, and you already brought it up, if someone says something that's pandering to the boss, if they're not totally sincere about it, or at least aware that they need to act as very well as if they're sincere about it, the boss is going to subconsciously be an x-ray machine and see what's happening. Yeah. And, and yeah. so it's, so you have to be a good actor as well, almost the exact same skills as what an actor has. Yes, and I try to make the point, you know, that it often carries with it some, some moral uh, condemnation, like, oh, why can't we just be who we are? Why does someone who's acting as if it's a bad thing? But that's completely hypocritical on our part. When we were children, we learned how to act. We learn how to smile to get what we want from our parents. We learn how to cry extra hard to get what we want from our parents. We're trained from early on to be consummate actors. We're continually acting. That's why many people have compared human life to something in, in theater, a play or a movie. And the thing is, you want to be aware of the fact that you are an actor and that other people are doing this as well. So when it comes to your point about the x-ray machine, which is an interesting metaphor, and I agree with that. There's one thing that I'm trying to make clear in this book is that people, we read humans, other people around us in nonverbal ways, and we're not even aware of it. We pick up cues from people, their fake smile, their fake laugh, or their actually very sincere laugh, their very open body language. We're reading people like dogs are sniffing other dogs and figuring them out. We are always aware and reading people, although we're not conscious of this. And what we're picking up are all sorts of incredible little micro signals from how they carry themselves, how they walk, how they look at us. The eyes are incredible expressive uh, organs. I mean, we can interpret an incredible amount from the way people look and, and the size of their pupils and how, how closed the eyes are, et cetera. 
is a whole language of smiles. I can't cover the whole thing in this one chapter. And there are all sorts of excellent books on nonverbal behavior. And I reference them in my bibliography. I'll give you some ideas about how to go to be a much more better observer of these cues that people are constantly giving out. You know, let's just start from one basic idea here. We are animals. We like to think of ourselves as something above that, even though we're aware that we evolved from chimpanzees. We don't think of this fact that we are animals and animals have a sense of other people, something visceral, something nonverbal. And I'm just trying to make you more aware of this incredible language that people give out that you're not aware of. Yeah. So, and like you give, so, uh, you give many tactical examples. Um, so for instance, to have a, a smile appear more sincere, uh, involve the eyes a bit more. Like you could tell if someone's smiling insincerely, if they're not involving the eyes or they're using only one part of their mouth and, and, and so yeah. on. And then uh, in, in the other chap in another chapter, the law of envy, you describe techniques to see if someone's envious of you based on how their eyes react when you tell them good news as an example. So you give lots of uh, many tactical examples in the book. Right. And like you say, it's almost, it's too many to mention right now, but I hope someone makes a, a cheat sheet with all the tactical <laughs> examples. You, you can make a whole book about this book, which is just like a mini book of body language. <laughs> yes. I mean, I have a whole chapter just on body language, but then in other chapters, for instance, I have a chapter on, on what I call the shadow the dark side that everybody has, and I explain what it is. There's a repressed side to people. It's something that we have we don't want other people to know about ourselves. It's our secret desires. It's the part of ourselves that even might scare us a little bit. And so in a chapter like that, I have cues uh, as to how you can pick up people's shadow. So for instance, when someone is um, normally a really nice person, and then they suddenly get angry and they suddenly vent at you and they suddenly show this, this vicious, almost animal side in their face. Your tendency will be, oh, that's just, they were just in a bad mood and, they'll, and they themselves will excuse it saying, I don't know what came over me, they'll apologize. And you'll fall for that and you'll think, well, I should judge them based on what they normally give me. That was just an exceptional thing, I'll forgive them. The truth is, in a moment of like that, people are actually revealing who they are. They're normally disguising themselves. And in that moment, they flash their anger and their vitriol or their resentment or their envy. They're actually finally showing you something that they've been trying to conceal. And so it's sort of a, a sudden burst of emotion is a cue of, of something going on deep within. Every chapter I go into these cues and kind of show you like, here are signs of people's being grandiose. I have a chapter on grandiosity. This is, you can look at it, you can see it in their body language. I've worked for people who I would classify as grandiose. And so I sort of know what I'm talking about. So as you say, each chapter, you could kind of create a cheat sheet for how to interpret this behavior. And, and also how you could potentially use that those same laws to your benefit. Like there's kind of a flip side to every law, which is, like in, I think it's in the the law of fickleness, uh, which which is is really titled, uh, you know, make them want to follow you. And you have this whole story of John D. Rockefeller. Uh, 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 oh no, that was, he was in the law of aggression. But yeah. the the Queen, law of Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, Queen Elizabeth. So you're describing how she became this great leader, and and it started off with her, you know really kind of empathizing and showing empathy toward, towards the crowd that received her when she first uh, marched through uh, the town and, and everything. So, yeah. so it seems like you can use these laws, if you understand them, to be a leader or to be more persuasive instead of just being persuaded. Like there's that flip side. Yes, um, each chapter ends with a section on, you see, most of the chapters deal with a, what we would assume to be a negative quality about humans, irrationality, narcissism, repression, compulsive behavior, envy. And at the end of each chapter, so I don't make this book so gloomy that no, everyone will just go kill themselves after they read it. I have a section on how you can turn this chapter, this idea into something positive. 
because obviously we humans have potential for incredible good. And to say that this is only a dark side to us is unrealistic. We're an amazing animal that has incredible powers of cooperating and working with other people and accomplishing things. And I want to show you how you can take what's kind of a flaw in our nature and turn it around. So to take an example, I have the chapter on envy. And I, you know, I make it clear that none of us like to ever admit that we're envious. It's an ugly emotion. It means we recognize that we're inferior and we think someone else is better than we are. We don't like to admit that to ourselves. So at the end of that chapter, I show you how you can turn envy around into something positive. By our nature, even this, is, this goes back to chimpanzees, we compare ourselves to other people. I mean, just take spend a moment on Facebook or Twitter and you see this in action. We're continually aware of what other people have and what they're doing, and we're comparing ourselves. Is my book selling as well as Malcolm Gladwell's? Am I as good looking as Brad Pitt, et cetera? We're always thinking in these terms. And that's what causes us to feel envy. So I end the chapter on a way how to flip that and make it into something positive. So for instance, I say, instead of uh, always comparing yourself to people who are better than you and wishing you could be them, why don't you learn to compare yourself to people who have it a lot worse than you and, and feel kind of empathy for them? You know, for the 20 people who have things that you don't have, there are millions of people who have things that you don't have. So you think of it in those terms and then learn how to emulate people. Find if there's someone who's superior to you in sports or in playing a game or in life in general, instead of envying and grinding your teeth and hating them and being bitter, see that as a spur to make yourself better, to, to, to reach their level. So I'm giving you a, a sense of how you can take this natural comparing mechanism in the human brain and turn it into something positive. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy.
the future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. I'll do one more question on the law of willfulness here, and then this leads into the law of covetousness, uh, if I'm saying it right. But, you know, willfulness, there, there's sort of a, a, you know, a compassionate or, you know, an empathy component to that, which is that if you're going to influence somebody uh, to, to, to carry out your will, so to speak, you need to, you need to have empathy for them and understand what, what, yeah. like you say, what drives their self validation. So then you have the door open to, to influence them. What would you say is like, let's say a, a primal technique for influence? Well, um, you've kind of already hit upon it. I mean, it's, it sounds simple, but it's actually the truth. Think of it in your own life. You go through your day to day grind at your office or wherever, and it's pretty rare when somebody shows you attention, where they're actually like listening to what you said, they're actually aware of what makes you as an individual. Normally we have the impression that people are wrapped in themselves and they're not really listening to us. So if you can give people the opposite impression, they said something in a conversation, just offhanded comment. And the next day you pick up on what they said, making it clear to them wow, you really were listening. You not only heard what I said, but you were referring to it the next day is already a signal to them that you're not like other people. You're aware of them. If they express an interest, a particular interest in a, in a, in a writer or in a film, or et cetera, you pick up on that and you're aware that this shows something about their value system and you mirror that value system and you say, you know, I feel the same way. I really, uh, you know, of course, this could be fake. It's much better if it's real. And I tell you that there's always something, you can always find something good in people to reflect 
that that self opinion. But so you don't want it to be like completely fake. We can all see through that. But just the fact that you're aware of that individual's value system, of what they've been saying, of what drives them, that will immediately lower the fences. That will immediately start melting them and, and, and contains great power. I mean, there are other things that I can go into more specifically, but that's by far the most important. So let's let's discuss uh, the law of covetousness. Am I saying it right? Covet. I would I would say um, covetousness. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and I think, and, and, I and think. the chapter. So that's a law, and the the chapter's titled "How to Become an Elusive Object of Desire." And your your first story in there is about uh, Coco Chanel, who's a, a fascinating character. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm always intrigued by this. You know, because you know, obviously, there's this basic law of economics that if you reduce the supply of something, value goes up. And so essentially right. what you're saying is if you reduce somehow the supply of yourself, the other people's desire for you might go up. But there's also the expression out of sight, out of mind. And so how do you, how do you reconcile those two, uh, you know, two sayings? Well, that's a good question. And I've addressed this in other books as well in the 48 Laws of Power, chapter 16. And in seduction, uh, a lot in seduction. And what I say is, think of it as a delicate dance between presence and absence. If you are too present in people's lives, and we can see this more clearly when, when it's like a romantic relationship, we suffocate them. We're too obvious. It's like they can take us for granted. We don't have high self-esteem. We're always trying to badger them and see whether they like us or not. And if we're too absent, then, you know, there's no connection. There's no nothing to grab onto. Um, they, they will stop thinking about us. So it's a game between these two things, a delicate balance. It's a dance. It's actually not that difficult to master. Most people, especially in the world today, err on the side of presence. We live in a world of social media where everything's supposed to be transparent, where we're always in each other's faces with what we ate the night before, who we saw, etc. And we think that being so transparent and obvious and so present in people is a good thing, but it's not. It reveals that we're weak. We show all, we show too much of ourselves. We don't stimulate their desire. I say like, I, I compare this to the grass is greener syndrome, which we all know is so basic to us. We think we have something that we like and then we see what the other person has. Oh, that must be better. I always think of it, I, I'm a sports fanatic and I'm always like, I'm a big Los Angeles Laker fan. I'll just reveal that right now. And um, if you look on the message boards, the people are always going, oh, if we could only get that player on that team, we'd suddenly be great. And, you know, and this player on our team isn't so good. We're always looking elsewhere and thinking that what the other person have it has is better. Well, you want to do that, have that effect on other people as well. You want to create desire in them, and you can suffocate that desire by being way too present. Napoleon had a quote of, if I appear in the theater too often, people will take me for granted. So I have to learn to appear in the theater in Paris like once a month so that when I do appear, people are excited. Oh, will Napoleon appear? And then he does, and wow, it means something. How, how do so you find the, the right balance, though, per situation? Because every situation is different. Well, you have to be sensitive to the other person. You have to be sensitive to the moment. So, for instance, being absent at a particular moment will cause problems. Let's say the person doubts you and doubts whether you're sincere and doubts whether you, you might be a seducer or you have ulterior motives. Being absent in that moment will be the wrong thing. But let's say that you've been texting people and phoning this person and suddenly they grow quiet and they're not responding to you as much as you want. Well, you've probably saturated them with your your presence and they've actually kind of are a little bit nauseated. They've, oh, they've had too much of you and they need some distance. They don't find you as special or particularly interesting anymore. All right, now you're going to step back and feed them some absence and make them wonder about you and make them think again whether they have you as taken, that they can take you for granted. So you have to be sensitive to the, to the signals that people send. But in general, 
and men have this problem a lot, you're being too obvious, you're being too present, you're being too persistent, and you're creating a reaction in the other person like, well, you must not be that special if you have, have to pursue me so hard. You want to make the other person pursue you a little bit. What about in a in a mass way? So, you know, for people building a business or for people building a personal brand or, or trying to achieve uh, some kind of fame or selling books or being a social media influencer or whatever, how do you how do you do the balance when your audience is sort of the nameless masses? Well, it's, this is it's a great question, and it's a little bit different. Obviously, too much absence will cause a lot of problem, and you want to have a brand, and you want to have presence. But I always think of, of someone like uh, Michael Jackson or even Beyonce. They know that if they put an album out, Michael Jackson learned to wait an extra year and create a kind of aura and cr- make people anticipate what's coming next. There's always a way to stimulate that kind of effect putting some a bit of mystery and aura. Maybe it's not that you're absent, but maybe it's the sense that people don't know who you are. You have a bit of mystery about you. You selectively reveal a new quality about you or your product that, that they hadn't imagined. You want to stimulate people's desire. Think of it this way. We know that in advertising, that people are barraging us with all kinds of ads to like this product or not, and we tune it out. But if we hear by word of mouth that this book is really a great book or this product, we think, oh, we suddenly are different because it's like we have decided now to investigate it. Our will is now engaged in the process. We are the ones doing the pursuing. And when we feel we're doing the pursuing, when we feel we're the ones who are initiating it, we're much more likely to desire that thing, to to pursue it. You know, it, it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned Michael Jackson and Beyonce and they were sort of, they sort of reached stardom in the the age before the the niche, the niche celebrity. Yeah. Like everybody now is kind of a celebrity or in their own niche. So they could kind of be overexposed in that sector, but then other people from other sectors might then hear about them. So there's, there's even a more delicate balance, I feel. Yeah, but but you you can always go too far. In fact, people generally do. So you can saturate people in your niche and make a name for yourself and get a lot of attention. But how do you keep that going for three years, four years, five years? People will become sick of you. You your music might appeal to this this small group and you're very successful, but after two years they'll quickly move on to someone else because they're tired of you. They want people want something new. They always want something new. How do you keep playing that game and constantly stimulating their desire? So how do you drop the seed of mystery into that? Like, because like for me, for instance, it almost feels unnatural to be mysterious. Well, there's several ways to do it. It's something that's predictable. Like, do you do a podcast, or you you disappear for a few weeks, or you're promoting something that seems a little bit different. You don't. You want to stay within your brand. You don't want to seem like you're insane, like you can be anything. But making it so that people don't really know what you might do next. Perhaps you, James, I'll, uh, make an announcement that you're going to go in a new direction now and you're going to, you're going to alter things a little bit, but you don't say what it is and you, and, and you let people guess and then you kind of roll it out slowly. And then you want to make it so that people are thinking about you and wondering what are you going to do next. You know, that's that's what makes certain celebrities or certain artists last past that five year, uh, di- you know, di- expiration date that most fame has. You know, a Pablo Picasso or an Alfred Hitchcock or Michael Jackson or Beyonce. They're constantly changing things. They're not always doing their styles alter. The, the, the music changes, they, 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 they mix things up a little bit. So you keep people guessing and you make them think, I don't really know James 100%. I think I know him generally. He's got this image, but maybe there's more to him than meets the eye. If you can do that, then you've, you've come a long way. You know, Picasso is a great example because every five years, he basically reinvented what sort of art he was doing and there's a certain right. confidence with that too, that he can say, 
I don't, and you know, and Bob Dylan is known for this as well. Yes. There's a certain confidence in, in saying, I don't care what my audience thinks. I'm going to move forward with my new, my, my, my new self, my new form of art. Yeah. So there's a little bit of the artist that it just wants to, is getting bored themselves and wants to try something new. But it's Bob Dylan's a great example of being always like a half step ahead of what's going on. So I, I'm old enough to remember him and he, his early on, he was just basically a folk singer. And then he came out with an album, I forget which one, that was quite heavily rock and roll. It was heavier with the electric guitar. And his hardcore fans go, God, I don't like Bob Dylan anymore. He betrayed us. Who is he? But he was ahead of the curve and he knew that folk rock was like something coming up. I have a chapter in the book about the zeitgeist and figuring out what the zeitgeist is. And that's sort of the answer to what we're talking about here. People operate in generations. Um, each generation has a kind of personality to it. And that personality is in flux. And certain, certain figures appeal to the zeitgeist. And if you can be a little bit ahead of the curve, if you can figure out what the next trend is, and you shake things up and you do that, People will always be attracted to you. They'll think of you, they'll think of you as a magician. And so Bob Dylan was like a half step ahead of the curve there. He understood that just being a folk artist was very limiting to his audience. But creating like folk rock, well, that opened up a whole new world to him. I've done it a little bit. I'm not tooting my own horn, but with my books, I had a lot of success with the 48 Laws of Power. It's been my biggest seller. But I realized early on that if I just kept repeating the 48 laws, it's it's a very limiting factor to how far I can go. My audience will be solid, but it won't grow. So the key is to grow the audience. And um, so, you know, my seduction was, was sort of picking a new angle. Um, the 50 Cent book was kind of looking for a different audience, a more urban audience. And then uh, Mastery was a different book than the other books. On a, you know, had to deal with your own self and your career, and it wasn't so Machiavellian. And now, through each of these five different books, I've expanded to a new audience. So that's sort of the key: is to always not just sort of stay stuck in the same kind of creative rut. So I want to talk a little bit. I, I love this chapter, "The Law of Compulsive Behavior." Uh, uh -huh. uh, which is is titled uh, "Determine the Strength of People's Character," and your your main story in that book is about Howard Hughes, who right. I've been I've been reading about him since I was a little kid because when I was a kid, he was essentially the richest man in the world, and right. and he certainly had an air of mystery around him, somewhat you know out of his control, but it it existed. And uh, uh, and I was surprised to learn when reading your book that essentially he was a failure at everything he did, uh, except for his main source of income, which was his father started. Well, he wasn't. It's not completely accurate, and maybe maybe I gave the wrong impression in there. Howard Hughes was good at one thing. He loved flying, and he was a very good aviator, and he was actually a very good designer of planes, but he imagined that he was much more than that. He imagined that he was this brilliant businessman, this brilliant film director, this brilliant film producer, on and on. And he didn't realize that he was actually terrible at these things. He was not a good organizer. And so he kept trying to build a new kind of aircraft industry. And um, Time and again, he made the same mistakes, the same failures, but the people who dealt with him were so in awe of this image that he created of this maverick who was a great inventor that they went into business with him and then they would lose millions and billions of dollars in the process. Um, and so the truth was he was a terrible, terrible business person. He was given constant contracts with the army um, million dollar World War II contracts, and he would end up producing one plane for them, the, the, the Spruce Goose, instead of the 180 that they ordered. He was a terrible at organizing. And so my the point of the chapter is 
people never do anything once. When they reveal that they make a certain mistake in business or in the arts or whatever, you can be sure that they will repeat it. If someone does something to you that's a little bit hostile or that makes you angry, you can be sure that that's not just an exception, that they will repeat that behavior. And I make the point that everyone has a character. We have qualities that are deeply ingrained in us based on our genetics, based on our childhood and, and our parents, and our lives tend to fall into patterns, weird patterns that we repeat over and over and over again. We have compulsive behavior. And so you want to be able to judge people's character by seeing their patterns, not by looking at their resume or their charming smile or everything that they try and show you, but look at their past and their patterns and they will reveal that underlying character. The ability to judge people's character, to see whether they're strong or weak, is one of the most important things that you can have. It will stop you from choosing the worst kind of romantic partner that will make your life miserable. It will prevent you from hiring people who are who who are charming but who are slackers or who are out to, to steal your company from you. It will help you not choose presidents or po politicians who are going to ruin the country inadvertently or whatever. It's a key, key skill, seeing behind people's masks and judging what's the character from deep within. So, so um, first, Robert, I want to ask if you if you need like a five minute break or anything, because uh, uh, I, oh, I have a, nice. I have a few more questions if you don't mind. Uh, but uh, but I want no 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 uh, no no problem. I can go on. This is also so fascinating. I can go on for a while. So uh, the next the next law I am curious about is what you call the law of aimlessness. Yeah. Uh, and the chapter title is "Advance with a Sense of Purpose," and you you talk about. Uh, Martin Luther King, which is such a great example, but I think um, a big question, and you and you answer this in the chapter. Right? It's it's actually an answer that similar to what I often recommend to people, but maybe you could describe the critical question is how does one find a sense of purpose? Not even just as a twenty year old, but let's say in this shifting economy, as a fifty year old who just lost your job of thirty years. Say, how do you how do you take a step back and find? what your sense of purpose is, so you don't feel that aimlessness? Well, um, it's it's another million dollar question. And um, I talk a lot about it in my previous book, Mastery, but I readdress it in this book. And the key is, I, I don't want to get too philosophical because it's a very practical question. It's a very important one, but um, the problem that a lot of us have in the world today is that we don't know who we are. We don't know our own tastes, our own values, what makes us tick, what makes us unique. I try and make the point in this book and in Mastery that you are an individual, you are unique. There is no, your DNA, the way your brain is wired, your experiences in life, your particular parents will never ever be replicated in the history of the universe. And so there's something very special and different about you. And it, it's reflected in often in your early childhood, in your tastes, in things that you are naturally drawn to. This is most obvious in people who are very successful in life. So it's kind of a, it's a good example, but for a lot of people it's frustrating because they'll say, well, I'm not like that. But uh, let me just pursue it for a moment. So for instance, Steve Jobs, is six years old, he's walking with his father down the streets in Sunnyvale or somewhere in California, and he passes an electronic shop with all these gadgets, these weird new gadgets in it, and his eyes light up, and he's so excited. He's never seen anything like that. And that ends up becoming a sign of something that he pers that, that is consistent throughout his life. He's excited by gadgets, technology, but not just what how they work, but their design. I talk about how Tiger Woods is a year and a half old and he's watching his father hit golf balls in the garage and he's so excited he can't he can't control himself he has to do the same thing. I talk about uh, Albert Einstein who was given a compass when he was like 5 years old and suddenly he's fascinated by this idea that there are forces in nature that you can't see but that move that needle on the compass. I you know I could multiply these examples a hundredfold. Um 
And you probably had that somewhere in your childhood, maybe not as obvious as that, maybe not as dramatic, but there was something you were drawn to when you were very young. And what happens as you get older is I compare it to a voice. I say Martin Luther King, who knew from very early on that he was great with people and he wanted to be like the leader of some kind of movement. It was like a voice in his head that was directing him to where he wanted to go. So Steve Jobs, um, Albert Einstein, et cetera, there's a voice saying, this is where you should be. This is what who you are. And as we get older, we lose touch with that. We listen to our parents. We listen to the culture at large. And suddenly we're 30, 40 years old and we're a lawyer or we're in some job that we don't really connect to and we're downsized and we feel like we're at a loss. We're aimless. We don't know where to go. Well, you need to reconnect to who you are. You need to look at those things that excite you the most. I call them primal inclinations. It may not be so simple. It may not be just a simple thing like a golf ball, et cetera. I can speak from my own experience. I knew when I was about eight years old that I loved writing in books, and I knew that I wanted to be a writer. And my path in life is that I could never figure out what to write. I started off with journalism, then I tried to write novels and plays. Then I got into Hollywood and I wrote screenplays. And I could basically say I was a failure in all of those different um, uh, arenas because they weren't connecting to something meaningful to me. It wasn't who I was. Finally, in 1996 or 95, I met a man who makes, produces books. And he said, Robert, why don't you do a book? And a, a light bulb went on in my head. God damn it, a a nonfiction book, this is what I should be doing. This takes all of my interests, all of my experiences, and funnels it into something that fits me. So the lesson there was I kept trying my hand at different things that excited me but weren't quite right until I found the right thing. So you need to experiment. You need to look at what excites you and to try your hand at it, not being afraid to fail. If you're 45 years old and you suddenly lost your job, you're not in the position to experiment a lot. You're not in the position to suddenly try a totally different career. And what I advise is you take the skills that you have because we live in a skill-based world and the more skills you have, the better. So even if this is a job that you didn't like, you learn something from it and you wanna take those skills and you wanna apply them in a different way, in a direction that suits you more. I've said it in other interviews that there was a a young woman who has a podcast. She had gone to law school and became a lawyer. And by the age of 30, she decided that she didn't like it. It wasn't who she was. Um, But she had always loved like writing and journalism. And so she decided to become a writer about legal matters and to write books about famous law cases and then maybe even do fiction. That's the kind of path I'm talking about. Take what you have, the skills that you've acquired, and apply them in a direction that suits you. But you can never get to that point if you don't know what suits you, if you don't know who you are, if you don't know what your tastes are. So just to kind of um, almost summarize what, what you so far have said is you have to try at least a little bit many things during life, whether young or older, but uh, another thing is, and this is what what I always tell people: list what you enjoyed. Let's say between the ages of six and thirteen, and age them. So, for instance, if you like like Steve Jobs, if you liked gadgets at the age of six, and you and now you're twenty five, and you age the concept of a gadget, suddenly computers are in that right, universe. Right. Um, and that's, for that's and, a good that's a good concept. I like that. And then, and then the third thing, which you mentioned in the book and is also very valuable, is the ability to combine skills. So, for instance, right. you know, you talk in mastery and and, and uh, about the ten thousand hours and so on. Uh, yeah, you can borrow three thousand hours from here, five thousand hours from here, and kind of at the intersection yeah. of a variety of interests, you have more hours than anybody else in the world. Yeah, and, and I think the example that comes to my mind that I talked about in Mastery that I, that I think fits this is Paul Graham. I don't know how many people are, aware, are familiar with Paul Graham. He was uh, um, He's a great um, computer uh, software programmer who started 
a company called Y Combinator, which is worth billions of dollars. He sold it. Anyway, Paul Graham loved computers from a very young age. His father was involved in computers in the 70s. And he knew that that was his path. And he studied artificial intelligence before anyone else was. He got a degree in computer programming from, I think, MIT. But he hated politics and he hated dealing with people and he wasn't happy. And he thought he thought there was something else that he wanted to do. So he dropped that and he went to art school and he lived in Italy and he became a painter. And then he was in New York and he was in his loft painting and he heard an ad on the radio for this new thing called Netscape and how Netscape was going to allow people to buy things on the Internet. That was the future. And it was like, what a weird concept. We will buy things on the Internet. And a light bulb went on in his head and he goes, man, I'm, I'm sitting here struggling as an artist. I'm not happy, but I've, I have all these skills in programming and in design as an artist. And I can take these things and I can combine them into something incredible. And he created the first online store for buying things online. He sold it to Yahoo for millions of dollars and that set the course of his life. And then he's sort of like a Picasso. He keeps changing things every few years, but he combines several interests in programming and hacking in artificial intelligence, in art and in design and into the perfect storm. So he was, you want to be your, your most creative year. I'm afraid to say is in your early thirties. Damn. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't mean, <laughs> it doesn't mean that, you know, you can still be doing things. I wrote this last book in my old, my late fifties, but you want to, by the time, if you're young enough to listen to this, by the time you're 30, you want to have skills in at least two or three areas so that that light bulb will go off in your head when you're 31, you go, ah, I can combine this, this, and this, and create something that no one else has ever made before. I'll say one other thing about how to get in touch with yourself. Not only look at what you're drawn to, what you love, but also look at what you hate, what turns you off, what you dislike. It may be working in a company. It may be politicking. Um, that means you're not, you're, you're probably an entrepreneur. You shouldn't be in an office situation. Maybe it's the opposite. You can't stand being alone. Well, then you shouldn't be a writer, that's for sure. You should choose something where you're around a lot of people, a, a sort of a, something like what a community activist or something like that. So look at what you also really repulses you, what makes you angry. You don't, you, 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 I could compare it to swimming in a current. You wanna swim with the current and not against it. And if you're pursuing a job or a career that doesn't really click. It's like you're always swimming upstream and you're never going to get there. But if you find what what works with you, what, what you get excited about, suddenly you'll find the energy to accomplish great things. Right, and you 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 kind of refer to the flow state. Once you find that sense of purpose, the, the hours sort of slip away as you're, as you're doing it. Um, right. You know, I, I wanted to ask because it's it's... It's very relevant to, I feel, more than ever to today's current environment, uh, the law of conformity, where yeah. uh, essentially it's it's related to you know herd behavior, where the the more you attach yourself to the herd, whatever herd that is, the more irrational your decision making might be, and I kind of see that on both sides of the fence happening more and more, like everybody sort of signs up for their team and they all have to agree to the same 50 or 60 topics or they get kicked off the team and with all the resulting depression that comes with that. And yeah. I'm just curious, how do you go about avoiding conforming to group behavior? Well, the first thing is to be honest with yourself and to realize that you are conforming to other people. The worst thing is to be in denial. And that's what I'm trying to hit you over the head with in this book. You'll, you'll naturally go, oh, I'm not like that. I do what I want to do. I don't listen to other people. I don't vote according to what my party's voting for. I'm independent. Well, hell, hell you're not. You're, you're, you're much more of a conformist than you realize because that is human nature. We are a social animal. And I go into the neuroscience and the biology as to why we imitate other people, why we are so easily influenced 
by the emotions and beliefs of other people. You are not immune to this, no matter what you tell yourself. I, Robert Greene, who wrote the book, I am not immune to that. I happen to, to I'll say it right up front, I'm, I'm a Democrat. I've been voting Democrat my whole life. Uh, I'm not saying I'm superior. I'm just telling you that's who I am. And I will have that same kind of group mentality myself. I will tend to react according to the, the party and how you know I'm supposed to react. And I catch myself and I go, no, stop that. Think for yourself. Sometimes there are things that conservatives say that make sense. You know, you have to be aware, first of all, that you are conforming, that you are influenced by what other people are doing and saying before you can, can begin to cut that off. I had to make the same point in my chapter number one about rationality. You are not a rational human being. Admit it. Here are the signs of it. I show you the signs of it. If you realize that you are not rational, that you are largely governed by emotions, you can now begin to divorce the emotions from, from your decisions and opinions slowly and become rational. But your denial is the big problem with all of these elements in human nature, envy, the shadow, etc. So you are a conformist. When you admit that and you realize it, now you can begin to work in the opposite direction. You have to look at your opinions and your ideas and evaluate them. Did that idea come from just myself and from how I look at the world? Or, was it, or am I following the party line in this particular instance? You have to train yourself to open your mind to other possibilities. Um, and you have to understand how easy it is that you are influenced. You know, your people, uh, your friends are supporting this cause on Facebook. And wow, it seems everyone jumps on board and you're going to jump on board, step back and go, well, what is it? Analyze it. Look at it. Don't just simply follow what other people are doing. I know it sounds like easy advice, but the only way to follow that advice is to be aware of the fact that you are probably much more of a conformist than you than you realize. Well, well, it's interesting because as you mentioned before, a lot of this is being aware of these laws, acknowledging that we all succumb to them, but then also practicing this ability to step to 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 quote unquote elevate your perspective as you as you point out and yeah. try to analyze where on the spectrum you are with, with each of these laws in a situation and, and it basically just takes practice over and over and um you know you know uh, on the point of what of the law of conformity and figuring out is this my own opinion or is this the groups or where where am i in between you mention in the law of fickleness you mention about you know, a good leader will develop inner authority. And in the law of yeah. envy, you talk about how you should develop your sense of self-worth from internal standards. So there's a lot yes. of also work. There's not only the work on the outside where you see what's happening externally, where yes. these laws are taking place, but there's this inner work. And like, how do you, how do you start to develop that inner authority? Because that also is easy to say, but hard to do. Well, um, there's... I compare it to the fact that um, you have a higher and lower self. It's a metaphor I use. It's a little bit kind of a simplification, but I, I use it nonetheless. And I say that um, you know you realize this lower self when you become addicted to certain foods and you just eat it and you can't help yourself. You're aware of this lower self when you do what other people are doing when you don't do your work and you just slack off for hours on end, when you kind of give in to that easy animal within you, the path, take the path of least resistance. But you have a higher self. The higher self is weaker. It's a weak voice inside of you. It's, it's much easier to be that animal. That higher self makes you want to work according to your own standards. In those moments in your life, and we've all had them, when you've been on some project and your mind was absorbed in it and you had that experience of flow, you sense that higher self and it was a great feeling. All of your energies were intact, were engaged, and you felt whole, not, not all these different parts of you fighting each other. There are other things that are part of your higher self. You're empathetic to people. When you listen to them, when you help somebody, you feel good about yourself. 
you want to be able to develop this this higher self. And that is kind of the voice of the inner authority that I'm talking about. You want to bring that out more. You want to listen to it. It's telling you, be conscientious, develop good work habits, gain some skills and some discipline. And it's calling to you. And are you listening to it? Are you cultivating it? Um, It's also telling you, you know, all of these chapters are interconnected. So it's also connected to the law of aimlessness. When you're listening to who you are and to your own inclinations and your own tastes, you're connecting to this higher self and you're building that inner authority. If you, for instance, know that you love this particular, you have this particular idea or project that interests you and other people come to you saying, oh, that's a stupid idea. You can resist them because you have confidence and you know who you are and you know you came upon this idea based on a lot of thinking and based on who you are. You have that inner authority to resist all the date naysayers and the people who are gonna mess with your mind and try to make you feel insecure because you're more clear about who you are and what makes you different. So these are, these are different paths to take to developing what I call that inner authority. And this is also linked to your book Mastery in the sense that, you know, I think you can develop more in authority, inner authority on a topic if you're on the path to mastering it. Yes, um, in the sense of, you know, we're all insecure. It, it's human nature to be insecure and to be anxious and to doubt ourselves. But when you're on the path to mastery and you're accumulating those 10,000 hours, you're developing these little moments along the way after 800 hours, after 1,500 hours. I'm just pulling up numbers. Right. And in those mom- moments, you're building confidence. And you go, wow, I overcame this and I accomplished this. And it builds you confidence and it builds a sense of self um, that's very important that anchors you so that when other people doubt you or when you have failure, you can overcome that because you've learned that basically you can overcome any problem with enough practice. Um, I'm dealing with that right now in that I have to relearn how to use my left hand. And every day I have to do these tiny little incredibly banal tasks. But if I can do them after a week, I suddenly feel like, okay, I can accomplish this. And that sense of feeling like you're moving forward is incredibly incredibly important in this world because you're always going to have failure and you're always going to have doubts. All the geniuses, the Steve Jobs, the Leonardo da Vinci's, et cetera, and even Einstein had the doubters, had the people who hated them, had the people who said, oh, you're, you're a nobody, or they had moments where they, their project fell apart. We don't hear about that because we only see their great successes. Well, they overcame them because along that way to 10,000 hours, they had those moments where they saw this is working. If I practice, if I do this enough, I will be good at it. I will become a master of my of my profession. So, you know, it seems like you mentioned earlier that one of the things you discovered early on at, at age eight, you knew you wanted to be a writer, but clearly there's there's also another skill in there. When I read every one of your books, and like particularly this one, I think to myself, how many books did this guy read to write this book? Like your research abilities and your curating abilities, you must have read like a thousand books and and either took notes or remembered 99% of each book you read. Well, it, to the when we discussed aimlessness and I was talking about myself as a writer in my career, you know, I said I failed at journalism and I failed at writing plays and novels and screenplays. But that's not quite true. What those those moments taught me, I learned things from them. So from journalism, I learned how to write on a deadline and how to organize my thoughts. From plays and screenplays, I learned how to make things dramatic, how to make how to appeal to people's emotions. And I learned also how to research things um, and how to find information and how to organize my material. And all of that came together with the 48 laws of power. So um, I try and tell people, and I say it in mastery in particular, the ability to organize your thoughts, to organize your material, 
is the most important skill of all. Because a lot of people have great ideas, but they don't know how to organize them. They fall apart. If you're able to step outside and to see how you can organize the information into something higher, onto a higher level, if you can see that your product that you want to invent fits into something larger, fits into the zeitgeist and how you're going to go ahead and do it and the, and the many different tasks you have to do to organize it, then you're going to be able to accomplish it. So the ability to organize your thoughts is actually a critical life skill. And I had the good fortune of learning that early on in, in, in journalism and in, in university where I, when I wrote papers and things like that. You know, and, and it's interesting because you mentioned, and, and let's just assume for a second, the 10,000 hour rule is like this fixed magical rule, even though, you know, for everybody in every situation, it's not necessarily 10,000 hours to become the greatest in the world. It might be 8,000 for some people, 12,000 for others and so on. But let's say it's 10,000 for a second. Uh, you mentioned in these different areas, maybe you do 3,000 hours of one thing, 2,000 hours of another, but all together to put together these books, you've, you've achieved mastery, the, the 10,000 hours of combining these various skills. The question is, how many, given that everything has a learning curve where there's this sort of steep area where you learn something really fast to get to a point where it almost seems like you've mastered it. And then there's this huge, much uh, uh, fit flatter uh, part of the learning curve to really achieve the, the greatest in the world status. What percentage of the 10,000 hours do you think it takes to, 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 to get through the steep part of the learning curve? So from anybody on the outside looking in, it seems like you're close to the greatest, even though you, you know you have a long way to go. This might be well, a naive do, question. I don't know. I'm just, I'm no, just no, curious. It's a, good, it's a good question. I've never quite had it um, phrased that way, but it's a good question. It's like how much of the time is spent grinding and, and doing the, the little tasks until things start, start kind of flowing. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a quick example. So like, for instance, I'm a ranked chess master. So it, which oh. means... To the wow. outside world, I could essentially beat anybody in chess. But if I were to play, and I have played, the world chess champion, I would have zero chance. But to the outside yeah. world, nobody can really look at my games and his games and see the difference, But I, except I can see the difference, and anybody who's at my level can see the difference. Well, um, you know, first of all, we have to acknowledge that there are people who are simply superior in something that have a God-given talent from their DNA. So Michael Jordan is Michael Jordan, and you might be a talented basketball player, and you might put in your 10,000 hours, but you ain't going to be Michael Jordan because you're not. So, um, I, you know, you look at Bobby Fischer, um, who's somebody I've studied. Um, essentially, the 10,000-hour rule was essentially came from a study of chess masters, and it determined that at that 10,000 hour moment, people who've put that amount of time in suddenly are thinking on a higher level. You're right, it could be 9,500 or 11,000, but it's pretty certain something great will happen to you. Um, but then there are people who put in 20,000 hours. Believe me, at a certain point, Bobby Fischer had gone well beyond the 20,000 part. He lived and breathed chess. Now I imagine you, James, are not living and breathing chess uh, as like, is, is it Magnus Carlsen? Is that the, the champion now? Uh, yeah, he's the champion I've played because I've had on the podcast uh, Gary Kasparov, who was the world champion oh, for wow. about 20 yeah. years. Wow, yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. But these people have put in more hours than you. You have to just admit that. That's their whole life. Right. And chess is a function of patterns. This has been, this is uh, uncovered in the, uh, 10,000 hour rule is a great book called The Road to Excellence, the man who formulated the 10,000 hour rule. It's memorizing patterns. And the more patterns you have seen, the more you're able to recognize in a microsecond, this is where the game is headed. And if you know where the game is headed, you can make a move that will turn it, the direction in, in your favor. And Bobby Fischer had played since the age of five so many games 
and it imprinted so many patterns of games in his mind that he could recognize far quicker than you ever could where the game was headed and and turn the turn it in his direction. Right. So my my question is, which is that he basically were both like we're both on the top of the steep learning curve yeah. and then, but I will never, you know, we're, it, it's, it's the incline now is much less steep, but takes much longer to reach a Bobby Fisher level of status. Like you say, it could reach 20,000 hours of time. And so what I'm curious about for any new field, is it like 1000 hours, 2000 hours before the average uh, viewer can't really tell the difference between you know, one person and the greatest person in the world. You mean what separates a great person from a really great, from a master? No, what separates the beginner from the top of the steep part of the learning curve? Meaning, you know, kind of basic mastery is at this steep part, is at the top well, of the steep part of the learning you know, curve. It, it really depends on the field. Um, I think in music, learning like the piano, uh, they've measured like at 2,000 hours, you're able to do this. And at 5,000 hours, you're able to do that. And then at 10,000 hours, you're able to perform a piece and put your own kind of stamp on it. Whereas at 5,000 hours, you could play proficiently, but you couldn't bring any style or personality mm. into it. So there's certain things that you can measure that sort of show that you're not at the beginner level anymore, but I think it really depends on the field and what you're mastering, you know? But the other thing that we have to say here is 10,000 hours is a bit arbitrary. One of the main things to understand is if you start at the age of five, like Mozart did at the age of three, and you put in 10,000 hours by the time you're 19 or 20, that 10,000 hours has triple the value of someone who finishes their 10,000 hours by the age of 30 or 40. Because when you were younger, I'm afraid to say, your mind is fresher, it, it, it absorbs more information more easily, you're more open, and you become more creative. So it's also a function of how early on tense those 10,000 hours, you could spend 10,000 hours as a painter um, dabbling in it your whole life so by the time you're 70, you put your 10,000 hours in, you're not going to be a uh, Da Vinci at that point because it's spread out over too much time. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's a, it's an area that that fascinates me. So so Yeah, me too. You know, Robert, I'm so happy you came on the podcast. I think yeah. this is one of those books that, you know, the laws of human nature. This is one of those books where I felt like my IQ was rising. As I was reading the book, wow. you know, and I don't know, quite a compliment. there's not that many books I could say that about, like a lot of books are interesting and fascinating and fun to read, but like, this is not only a book to read, but to, to reread because there, there's so much valuable, there's so many valuable stories, so much valuable information, so many valuable techniques, so many things to be aware of in trying to optimize my, my daily living. So Thanks for, for coming on the podcast and answering all of my questions. Like I had so many questions. I'm, I'm really appreciative you, you, you oh, spent no, the time. No. My pleasure. It, it's The book is the culmination of all of the years I've been researching and reading about and studying people. So um, I put everything I had into it. And uh, it's very nice to hear you saying that. Well, thanks again, Robert. Robert Green, mm -hmm. The Laws of Human Nature. And uh, once again, thanks for coming on the podcast and I uh, hope to, mm -hmm. to see and talk to you soon. I hope so too, James. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Robert. Bye. Bye-bye. Hold up. 
Powered by Snapdragon, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra elevates your photography to epic new heights. Snapdragon processors deliver a color experience like no other with sharp, industry-leading 8K video capture. You can also snap images in 200 megapixels, capturing more detail than ever. And those late-night blurry pics are a thing of the past thanks to next-level night mode. Experience powerfully moving premium photography only with Snapdragon. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.